very much, Meta and friends. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. Um, so I, I've chosen a topic which really, this should be the title of the topic. Can we have a nuclear weapons free world? That's really the number one question. Um, but uh, I've added to it another little clause and I have to open the drawer here. How does it work? There, there it goes. And still have nuclear power. So uh, what I'm concerned about uh, is that uh, we, don't really re we don't really give enough reality to the concept of a nuclear weapons free world. We don't think of it as a real reality. And consequently, it doesn't become a goal that is real. It becomes just something we talk about, it's words, but not something that we visualize. We, we, we haven't done enough work on visualizing what a nuclear weapons free world might look like and how you could preserve stability in a world without nuclear weapons, realizing that the knowledge of how to make those nuclear weapons is still there. And uh, uh, that's really why I'm phrasing the question this way. What would happen if we had a nuclear weapons free world? Could we still, in those circumstances, have nuclear power as we do today, or as we might in the future? So uh, I've taken the image of the Minotaur uh, the Minotaur was a monster in Greek mythology who uh, did terrible things and uh, was too strong to imprison, uh, could break any prison that he was put into. And so uh, the king uh, got Daedalus, who was an incredibly uh, clever inventor, to fasten uh, an inescapable prison. And what he did was he built a labyrinth, and this labyrinth was enormous. It had rooms and corridors, and, uh, and what he did was he gave the Minotaur the impression of freedom, so the Minotaur could walk freely through these corridors and rooms, but no chance of escaping. And even Daedalus himself uh, would not be able to escape from this labyrinth that he had constructed. And I, I use this as a kind of an image uh, of uh, what we have in terms of the nuclear issue, is it it's all so mysterious. There are these huge walls, and it seems impenetrable at times. And there is this whole labyrinth of, of mystification and puzzlement uh, that it, it's, par it's paralyzing. And uh, Theseus, the, the champion who finally did go into the uh, labyrinth and kill the Minotaur, was uh, saved by a woman, of course. And that was Ariadne, who gave him a thread that he could just simply play out the thread and uh, once he had succeeded in killing the Minotaur, he could then find his way out of the labyrinth. Well, that thread is, I think, demystification and understanding, uh, of which we don't have enough. As my friend Robert Del Tredici, who took many of the photos I'll be showing you, says, that his main effort has been to try to make the invisible world of the atom visible because it's not culturally visible to us. And if it's not culturally visible to us, it does not really have, it does not smack of reality. And as a result, we feel helpless sometimes to really try and deal with it. So the key element here um, is uranium. This is a model of the uranium atom. Uh, it's at Oak Ridge, Tennessee where the uranium was uh, enriched for the first atomic bomb. These photos are from my friend Robert Del Tredici. The black and white photos mostly are. And uh, he likes this photo because of the children and the size of the atom. It's just, is it Atlas holding up the world or is it a child being, uh, you know, uh, overwhelmed by the weight of this issue? Uh, the uranium was discovered about 200 years ago, but it had no practical use until the time of the Second World War, when an amazing discovery was made about this metal uh, that made it different from all other naturally occurring materials. And uh, it's the key element for all nuclear technology because of this particular property it has, that the uranium atom can not only be split, uh, by provoking it with a neutron, uh, bombarding it with a neutron, but it can perpetuate that splitting through a chain reaction and consequently multiply the power of one splitting by an enormous number in less than one ten thousandth of a second. 
And that's what really is the secret behind the atomic bomb. So what happens is that when a neutron strikes an atom of uranium-235, which is a rare form of uranium, there are two varieties of uranium which are most common in nature, uranium-238, which does not undergo this type of process, the chain reaction, and uranium-235, which does. But uranium-235 is less than 1% of natural uranium, so it's very, quite rare. But when an atom, a neutron strikes an atom of uranium-235, it can split into two or more pieces, and these are called fission products. And being broken pieces of uranium atoms, they also are atoms, but they are highly unstable and consequently very, very radioactive. The radioactivity is a result of the instability of these things, which don't generally exist in nature. Some of them do, but the vast majority of them uh, are made by the fission process. And also, of course, you get energy. That energy is what uh, powers the atomic bomb and also what fuels nuclear reactors. And the most important of all, you get more neutrons, two or three more neutrons, average about two and a half. And uh, those more neutrons uh, are what can go on to split more atoms so that you get one atom splitting two, splitting four, splitting eight, splitting 16. If you just take a little hand calculator and multiply two by itself 64 times, you, uh, you will be amazed at the, the enormity of the number you get. Absolutely staggering. And this happens, th this 64 generations of splitting happens in less than one ten thousandth of a second in an atomic <coughs> bomb. <coughs> For a bomb, however, you must have highly one enriched uranium, HEU, excuse me? One, less than one ten millionth of a second. Or one ten millionth of a second. I stand corrected. Thank you, Derek. Thousand times fast. Yeah. Okay. Well, I said less than one ten thousand, so I I, uh, I, st <laughs> I stand by my remark. <laughs> um, but for a bomb, you have to have highly enriched uranium, which means a uh, very high concentration of uranium two thirty five, never to be found in nature. In nature, it's only zero point seven percent. And consequently, we have this process called enrichment, which many people do not understand that what the term means. But what it means is to increase the concentration of the uranium-235. And that is only done in a few places in the world. It's not a common, Canada has no capacity to enrich uranium. Even though we're, we're one of the largest uranium producers in the world, uh, we've never had a capacity to enrich <coughs> uranium. Um, because if you can enrich uranium, and this is why people are worried about what's happening in Iran, you have the ability to push it to the point where you can produce the raw material for a relatively simple atomic bomb. Now this is a monument, a Soviet monument to the splitting of the uranium atom that Bob photographed when he was over there. In the foreground is a statue of a man called Kurchatov who's thought of as the father of the Soviet atomic bomb. And in the background you have this monumental structure which uh, celebrates the instant of a uranium atom being split. And you can see the two hemispheres there are basically that, that hemisphere and that hemisphere. Those are the fission products. And the semicircles are simply an artist's uh, conception of the energy that's released when this happens, which is roughly 400 times more powerful than the most powerful chemical reaction at an atomic level. So. Um, it's that splitting which is really the heart of nuclear power and nuclear weapons. And uh, those fission products are really, at the same time, the things which constitute the bulk of what we call radioactive fallout from an atomic bomb and pollute the environment because they are material things which are radiotoxic. And they also constitute the bulk of the uh, uh, nuclear waste, the long-term nuclear waste from nuclear reactors. When they talk about the nuclear waste problem, they're really talking about those fission products because once they're created, we don't know yet how to uncreate them. People are working on ideas for how to do that, but uh, so far we have no practical way of uh, reversing or neutralize. We can't neutralize these materials once they're created. Uh, here's a picture of how the fission products can become disseminated. This man is actually uh, a weapons designer. That's his job. He designs nuclear weapons. And when Bob went to take this picture, 
he expressed great enthusiasm for the nuclear testing. He said, I hope testing never stops because it's so fascinating. He said, every time we explode an atomic bomb, we learn so much. And, uh, you know, we can write papers after paper and we learn so much about physics and about the nature of these things. And most of the people who work in these fields, they just think of it as a very interesting uh, physics uh, to, to just study these things. They don't think much about uh, the global geopolitical consequences of all that. Um, part of the human nature, I guess, in all of us, is that we, we, we tend to just get wrapped up in our job and not really think about what it, what it leads, what it adds up to. So I'm moving on to number two, the world's first nuclear explosions. Uh, many people don't realize that Canada was involved uh, fairly early on, in fact, quite early on, um, for one simple reason. Uh, this meeting took place in Quebec City in 1942, and uh, we have the Prime Minister of Canada, Mackenzie King, the President of the US, uh, Roosevelt, and uh, of course, uh, Churchill, the Prime Minister of Britain. And they are signing an accord called the Quebec Accord. And this Quebec Accord was a formal agreement between the three countries to cooperate in building the world's first atomic bombs. And the reason why Canada was there, well, first of all, no, I don't have to tell you the whole story. But the reason why Canada was there was because Canada was the only place in the free world that uh, they knew there was a source of uranium. There was uranium in Czechoslovakia. Hitler had invaded Czechoslovakia. There was a source of uranium in the Belgian Congo. Hitler had invaded Belgium. Uh, so uh, the only source of uranium that really was uh, readily available to the Allies, as far as they knew, uh, was uh, Canada. So Canada became a partner quite early on. Um, and in 1945, of course, the first two atomic, one, one atomic bomb was tested in the Alamogordo, uh, Alamogordo New Mexico. And then uh, two atomic bombs were actually used on the city of Japan three days apart, 1945. Little Boy, which was uh, dropped on Hiroshima and which was made of highly enriched uranium. That's, that's what was done at Oak Ridge. There were three secret cities built. One was the Oak Ridge city, the Hanford city where they produced the plutonium for the Nagasaki bomb, because that's the other bomb, Fat Man. That was the Nagasaki bomb and it was made of plutonium. Now. Uranium is the only naturally occurring substance from which you can make an atomic bomb. Plutonium is not naturally occurring. So uh, plutonium, and where does it come from? Uranium. So plutonium, uh, I mentioned that there are two types of uranium. It turns out that one of those types of uranium, U-235, can be used to make an atomic bomb directly. The other type is the breeding ground for plutonium. It uh, can be transmuted into plutonium which turns out to be an even more powerful nuclear explosive than uranium, uh, and consequently is now the favored uh, uh, primary nuclear explosive in all the nuclear warheads. It's mostly plutonium that is the trigger. Um, now the reason for the shapes of those two, those two bombs, you notice the shapes are quite different. The reason the shapes are different is because the technology is different. Uh, there is, uh, sorry. The uh, Hiroshima-type bomb is what, what's called a gun-type assembly. Basically, it's simply a question of firing one piece of uranium, highly enriched uranium, into another piece of highly enriched uranium. And it's really quite a simple mechanism. And this is scary, because it means that uh, any kind of half-decent, if you want to put it that way, terrorist group or criminal organization could make a very powerful weapon from highly enriched uranium. Now, uh, the plutonium is, a little, is, is more difficult because you have to have a trickier mechanism. It's called an implosion mechanism. And there's a practical reason for this. It turns out that neutrons are the important vehicle for an atomic explosion. That's what makes the atomic explosion occur. But with plutonium, there's more stray neutrons. It's called a neutron background. And this neutron background, there's so many neutrons flying around, it's sort of like trying to carry a fireworks through, through a, a, a place where there's, spark, there's sparks flying everywhere. And uh, it, it, you, you, you run the risk of what's called pre-initiation. It just doesn't get started at the time you want to do it to get the maximum blast. And so the reason for the implosion device is it's a much more rapid assembly. And it's necessary in the case of plutonium. It's not necessary in the case of highly enriched uranium. Uh, but even that plutonium device can be built by people with very little, surprisingly little uh, knowledge. 
Uh, there was a famous story of a Harvard University physics student who wasn't even one of the top students uh, as an undergraduate who actually made us a project to design a Nagasaki type bomb and he even phoned up the suppliers and got information from the suppliers as to what kind of shape charges he could get to do the job and uh, his, his essay was confiscated and classified because and the, the, they said it would have worked the device that he had designed would have worked. And he had no access to classified information. So, I mean, uh, people should not believe other people who say that this is beyond the capability of some terrorist group or so on. This is absolutely <coughs> untrue, and it's a very dangerous deception. Uh, people have to realize just how dangerous this stuff is. The only really, truly hard part of making an atomic bomb is getting the stuff. Getting your hands on the plutonium and getting your hands on the highly enriched uranium, that's the hardest part. The, I'm not saying the rest is easy, but uh, that's the hardest part. Now, uh, this is a picture of a H-bomb. Uh, You've heard of the H-bomb. Uh, this is the hydrogen bomb, which is based upon a whole different process called fusion. Fusion is not splitting atoms, but, but combining atoms like, uh, as what happens in the stars and the sun. Uh, mostly uh, uh, isotopes of hydrogen, hydrogen being the lightest element in the universe. Um, so, uh, but the, the trouble is, fusion doesn't really occur until you get up to about 40 million degrees. So the question is, you've got to get the temperature up there, and what they do is they use plutonium for that purpose. And without the plutonium, these hydrogen bombs are useless. They're not bombs. And when they talk about dismantling H-bombs, they're really d taking the plutonium out of them. That's what they're doing. So when you take the plutonium, and there's the plutonium right up at the top. It's sort of like a miniature Nagasaki bomb. That, uh, and the, the main purpose of that is to give a rapid supply of neutrons and to elevate the temperature very rapidly to the point where you can really get uh, the fusion occurring. And then once you've got that, the column of fusion material, uh, you can get uh, explosions. It's almost unlimited as to how large these explosions can become. One thing that many people, even physicists, don't always understand is that more than 50% of the uh, explosive power of every H-bomb is really from depleted uranium. It turns out that they use uranium-238 in the fabrication of the metal... Uranium-238 is not the explosive type of uranium, it's the other type of uranium. But that uranium-238 contributes most of the radioactive fallout and more than half of the explosive power of the bomb. So uh, uh, many people who are worried about depleted uranium in terms of battlefield munitions don't realize that it has had a long history in directly in use in nuclear weapons as well. Now uh, Canada became really uh, the world's largest supplier of uranium and in fact up until 19, in 1959 uranium was the fourth most important export from Canada. Um, after pulp and timber and wheat, uh, and all of that uranium was for bombs. It was all for bombs. It was all under military contracts. So there was a lot of mines operating and uh, big business and, sell and selling the uranium to the Americans under military contracts. So Canada did a great deal to, to really get the whole buildup going, uh, just through supplying the material. Now, in 1965, by then the contracts had dried up, by the way. Uh, they, they, they had started producing their own uranium in the States, uh, in the Four Corners area. Uh, they had done that before, but they were really coming into larger production. And uh, they were also basically unable to build bombs fast enough to use up all that uranium. So uh, those contracts were terminated, and uh, then President, uh, I'm sorry, Prime Minister, um, um, Gosh, I, I hit a blank with uh, Pearson, that's it, yes, yes. Who, who, by the way, many people may not know also, happened to be the Member of Parliament from Elliott Lake. But uh, Pearson uh, declared that henceforth all uranium sold by Canada would be for peaceful purposes only. So Canada's policy became a peaceful policy from 1965 onwards. Nevertheless, the last deliveries of uranium for military purposes was, uh, went as far as 1972 or thereabouts. Uh, th this is, uh, these are all of the uh, mills, the uranium mills in Canada, and it shows you which ones produce bomb material and which ones produce fuel for nuclear reactors. 
based, of course, I use the, uh, the year 1968 because there were some tail end uh, n contracts that had to be fulfilled, you know. Uh, so 68 is a kind of an arbitrary cutoff point. So these are, uh, obviously, Canada contributed a great deal to uh, uranium for bombs. Now, of, of course, this history is important for Canadians to know, but most Canadians don't know it at all. Um, so point number three is highly enriched uranium, the easiest nuclear explosive, as I've already said. Um, this is a model of little boy in, in uh, uh, Washington. I believe it's in Washington. Yes, I think that's at the Smithsonian, isn't it? It's a model of a uh, little boy hanging in the air there, made from highly enriched uranium. Now, uh, I mentioned earlier this gun type assembly method. Um, this is a very simplistic device. Uh, they use conventional explosives to basically fire one so-called subcritical piece of uranium-235 into another. Uh, this is a more, somewhat more realistic drawing uh, that uh, shows you the hollow uranium bullet which gets fired into the cylindrical target. And when they come together, you have a critical mass, and that's the mass which is necessary to support the chain reaction. Otherwise, it just doesn't, it's unable to support itself. There is fissioning occurring, but the, the fissioning is really fish also fizzling. And uh, it's only when you get a critical configuration that you can really get an explosive reaction. So uranium enrichment, what is it really? It's really a process of separating these two types of uranium, uranium-238 and uranium-235. Now that sounds like a fairly simple job. You say, well, we do that all the time, sifting and separating. The trouble is that uranium-238 and uranium-235 are identical twins. They're identical. They have the same chemical properties. Whatever one of them does, the other one does. And so you can't use chemistry to separate them. The only thing you can use to separate them is the very slight difference in their masses. The fact that uranium-238 is just a bit heavier than uranium-235. And as a result of this, the technologies to separate uranium-235 and 238 are amazingly complicated. Uh, some of the largest structures on the face of the earth are uranium enrichment plants. And they, they, they drift, they, they have to turn the uranium into a gaseous form called uranium hexafluoride. Uh, that's one of the few compounds of uranium which is known to be a gas. And then they can drift this gas through miles and miles of corridors and through these membranes that ever so slightly sift out the, let the smaller atoms through and the larger atoms get stopped a little bit. But you have to do it tens of thousands of times in order to get the degree of enrichment necessary. And consequently, this is not something you can do quickly. It, it's slow, energy intensive. In fact, the, the energy to, you, to, to do the enrichment is an enormous. They, 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 sometimes they use two nuclear reactors to, one, one, to run one enrichment plant. And an enrichment plant, typically of the old style, would use as much energy as a large city. So uh, they use coal in the States for, to run their enrichment plants, and, uh, but they use a lot of coal for that. Um, so this is what we mean by enriched uranium, is that you have much more uranium-235 and much less uranium-238, uh, whereas depleted uranium is the opposite. Depleted uranium is, is uranium which, uh, where the U-238 is a whole lot more than usual, and there's almost no uranium-235, a bit. There's still a bit. And now this is a graphic which I kind of like because it shows you natural uranium, which is 0.7%. I did the calculation. It's almost exactly 0.7, that picture. And uh, low enriched uranium is what's used as fuel for American light water reactors and most of the other reactors in the world. Light water, like the ones at Fukushima, for example. Um, and that's not weapons usable because there still is not enough concentration of uranium-235 to make it explosive. So you can't use that stuff. It's only when you get 20% and above that you get into the highly enriched uranium stage. And ideally, for weapons grade uranium, they want it to be more than 90% uranium-235. And uh, uh, if you've read about the highly enriched uranium at Chalk River recently, there's been a lot of news stories about it. You may have seen something on it. That's 93.3%. Uh, so it's, it's real weapons grade material. It's, it's lovely stuff from the point of view of weapons. You know, it's the same stuff that was used in the Hiroshima bomb. And, of course, they don't use it for bombs at Chalk River. They use it to produce medical isotopes. 
But, uh, but they are, the government of Canada has now announced that they're going to phase out completely the use of highly enriched uranium at Chalk River, but not elsewhere. There's a couple of other places that use highly enriched uranium uh, by 2016. So that, that's a step forward. But they should have done it a long time ago, really. Anyway, here we see a uranium enrichment plant. Look at how enormous that is. Look at how enormous that is. These things can be seen quite easily from space. So it's very difficult to hide uh, it's not impossible, but it's very difficult to hide a, a massive uranium enrichment project. Now, unfortunately, <laughs> human beings being clever things as, as we are, um, they're developing new technologies, laser enrichment, which is very scary. Because it means that with laser enrichment, you could really, you could really hide it a lot better. And uh, why they're putting money into developing this technology is beyond, well, I know why they're doing it, but it, it's very scary because uh, the problem is, you have to really appreciate the fact, and I think you all do probably, that, that nuclear weapons really spell the end of humanity. That if, if every conflict we had was, if both sides in every conflict that occurred had nuclear weapons, we'd be goners, as would most of the species of life on Earth. And it, it's really quite incredible. And uh, that using the same technology that they use to map climate change, they've shown that even a small local nuclear war, uh, say between India and Pakistan, God forbid, uh, that involved just a couple of dozen nuclear weapons on each side, would be enough to cause a, uh, a, a massive climate change uh, in the whole northern hemisphere. Massive crop failures and so on and so on because of the tremendous volume of ash and soot that would be thrown into the air uh, comparable to some of the largest volcanic eruptions that have ever occurred. But, uh, and in the case of a larger war, uh, it's, you were really talking about nuclear winter. So I'm not going into all that because I assume that most of you know that, but you know, most of our young people do not know this. And I think our educational system is really failing uh, young people. We've got to get our act together on this question of nuclear weapons or, or we're, gonna, we're not gonna survive. Um, Romeo Dallaire, Senator Romeo Dallaire, uh, made a point in the Senate of saying that, uh, you know, climate change is not the number one problem. The number one problem is nuclear weapons. Of course climate change is a huge problem, and it's great that people are taking it more seriously and so on. But this can do what climate change would take decades to do. This could happen overnight. Uh, so it's really important to, uh, to take this seriously. Uh, depleted uranium, there's huge amounts of depleted uranium canisters in the backyard of these enrichment plants. And the military helps itself to this depleted uranium because, and by the way, there's no discrimination here between civilian and military. Uh, there's no discrimination. There are no inspections of these depleted uranium stocks, only a kind of a, a bookkeeping of an aggregate sort. Because when the uranium goes into the enrichment plant, it's all blended together. So you can't really tell when it comes out what kind of uranium it is. It doesn't carry a little flag with it. And they, the military just helps itself to this depleted uranium, and they've done so for decades. And they use it for their nuclear weapons as well as for their conventional weapons. Gordon? Yes? Did, did you know if that's uh, uranium hexafluoride depleted? In yes, the I case? believe it is. I, I, I'm not 100% sure, Norm, but I believe it is. Now, there's a whole series of plants, all of which my friend Bob has photographed, where they convert it back into a metal and then they fabricate it into tubes and all that sort of thing. He's got photographs of that whole thing. In fact, had I more time, I would have shown you that because it's very fascinating to see all the different factories that are involved in preparing that depleted uranium for use in nuclear weapons. And, by the way, another thing I should tell you uh, is that not only is the depleted uranium used directly in the nuclear weapons, but it is also the raw material for producing the plutonium for the trigger for the nuclear weapons. So when, when you hear that, the, you know, have you ever pondered the question, how come every uranium mine in the world is peaceful? Yeah. There's no military uranium mine anywhere on the planet. Look at the Ukraine. Huh? Ukraine. Ukraine. Oh, maybe so, maybe so. But in the, uh, certainly, certainly in, in uh, the Western world at least, they, they say, oh, our uranium is all for peaceful purposes. The point is the military just piggybacks on it. They don't need, they don't need to buy uranium because there's tons of uranium lying around. They need to buy some of it in order to run certain things, but uh, uh, really the majority of it is just they help themselves to the leftovers. 
Now, uh, here we have our federal government has vowed Canada will make uh, highly enriched uranium-free isotopes by 2016. Um, you don't need to use highly enriched uranium to make medical isotopes. It just happens to be convenient because it, it makes it cheaper and it makes it faster. But they could have used low enriched uranium. Argentina has been doing it for years and years and years. They've been making medical isotopes using low enriched uranium, which has no military potential. And, and now we have in Canada, since the crisis with uh, Chalk River's NRU reactor, the NRU reactor, that one reactor, which is 55 years old, one of the oldest reactors in the world, produces one half to one third, between a third and a half, of all the technetium 99M used in the entire world. Um, one reactor, and that reactor is only 5% of the power of uh, a 1,000 megawatt electrical power reactor. So it's really a drop in the bucket in terms of uranium use. But nevertheless, they use the highly enriched uranium, which makes it a great security risk. The problem with this is that they set, uh, they set, uh, um, they set a terrible precedent for the rest of the world, and now Iran is using highly enriched uranium justification. They're saying, well, we need medical isotopes, so we need to produce highly enriched uranium. This is very dangerous. Blurring the distinction between civilian and military is very, very dangerous, because as soon as you make that and you blur that line, you just create openings for uh, confusion, which allow people to take the time necessary to produce weapons and weapons materials. Um, we, we are talking about sending, which I think is a very bad idea, we're opposing it, uh, my organization. They want to send 23,000 liters of high-level radioactive liquid waste containing highly enriched uranium over a period of four years along the Trans-Canada Highway and over bridges like the Thousand Island Bridge or Montreal Bridges, almost 2,000 kilometers down to the Savannah River site, which is a military site in the States, which has a terrible environmental record, by the way. And the rationale for these shipments is really kooky because uh, there's no way that this stuff is a proliferation risk where it is. At the same time that they want to ship this crap, if you'll excuse the expression, down on the highways, uh, they are bringing in fresh highly enriched uranium to Chalk River still. That's the stuff that's really the proliferation problem more so than this. Now, technically, they're both proliferation problems, but the point is that the, it's the metallic stuff coming in that is easily stolen, easily transported, and easily used. This stuff is not easily stolen, not easily transported, and not easily used. Why they're moving it? There are ulterior motives that have nothing to do with non-proliferation. Um, and by the way, here's Iran saying, uh, this is the ambassador to the United Nations, saying that they're, they're, they're building now 3,000 uranium enrichment centrifuges in addition to what they already have. Uh, so it's... Uh, it's worrisome. Uh, at the same time, I have to say that they're not really doing anything illegal. I mean, all the things that they're doing are illegal under the Non-Proliferation Treaty, under all international agreements. Uh, people are just scared. They don't like it. They're scared of it. They want them to stop. But there's nothing illegal in what they're doing. Um, and of course, the people who are pointing the fingers at Iran, don't get me wrong, I, I'm also very concerned about Iran and very concerned about what they're doing. However, the people who are pointing the fingers have their own stash of nuclear weapons right behind them, and they're enriching uranium all the time. And so the hypocrisy is really enormous. There's just enormous hypocrisy here. And that's, there's no way we can build a peaceful world on the basis of hypocrisy. We can't have a double standard any more than you can in any other, like human rights or civil rights or women's rights or anything. You've got to, you've got to have one law for all. Uh, so that's a real problem in the non-proliferation. Not for Americans, not for Americans. <laughs> <laughs> um, now we come to plutonium, the most powerful and the most popular nuclear explosive. Now, one of the reasons plutonium is, is popular is because it's powerful, uh, and consequently, smaller volume will do the same job. And, and that's very important in these H-bombs, because you want to try to miniaturize as much as possible the trigger part. Um, but also uh, because it's chemically set, it's chemically different from uranium, so you can separate it chemically. And that's a big advantage. You don't have to go through this enrichment process. And all you've got to do is chemically separate it. And the chemistry is not that complicated. What, what's complicated about it is the fact that the stuff you're separating it from is very, very radioactive. 
anyway, here's a picture, uh, another uh, photo of Bob's of the fat man model. Uh, these people are very proud to stand by it and be modeled by it. It's, uh, I'm not sure where the location of this is. I'll have to ask Bob where that is. Um, and the shape, of course, reflects the fact that it's got this uh, implosion device inside, which um, really uses high explosive lenses to produce this, it has to be spherically symmetrical uh, implosion in order to achieve maximum compression and then when it's right at the maximum compression, it's called maximum supercriticality. They give a little burst of neutrons with a, with a thing called a neutron generator, and that sets off the bomb. But you've got to have very, very fast assembly for this. This is an X-ray motion picture. It's not coming through very well of the implosion, a, a test of the implosion device. Of course, this was, this was one of the main problems they were working on in Alamogordo in New Mexico at Los Alamos. You notice, by the way, that they never tested the Hiroshima bomb because they didn't have to. It was so simple it couldn't fail. So that bomb didn't need to be tested. The only bomb that needed to be tested was this one because it's complicated and things could go wrong. And that's how much plutonium it takes to destroy a city. That, uh, that hand is the hand of Richard Rhodes, the author of the book, The Making of the Atomic Bomb. And uh, he had this glass paperweight made to be exactly the size of the plutonium ball inside the Nagasaki bomb. So uh, every nuclear reactor, any, every nuclear commercial reactor produces enough plutonium every year to make quite a number of these bombs. And uh, that goes on year after year. Plutonium having a 24,000 year half-life, this stuff is around forever. So uh, we are literally manufacturing on this planet uh, the best weapons usable material that you could have that doesn't need any really fancy uh, uh, technology in terms of uh, enrichment. It can just be used directly in bombs. And through a good deal of research on my part, I have also discovered something that a lot of physicists are unaware of, and that is that all isotopes of plutonium are weapons usable. All isotopes of plutonium. You can make a plutonium bomb, a very powerful one, from pure plutonium-240. A lot of people believe that 240 is not a nuclear explosive, and this is wrong. The reason they think so is because when they look in their physics textbooks, they see in a table that plutonium-240 is not fissile. But they forget the definition of fissile. Fissile means it can't sustain a chain reaction using slow neutrons. It can using fast neutrons. And in fact, all isotopes of plutonium have a smaller uh, critical mass than uranium-235. And uh, what's more, there are extra difficulties that do arise in making a bomb from, from the other isotopes of plutonium. Uh, the reason this is an important technical side point is that our nuclear establishment here in Canada, I am sure, has been misinforming the, gov the Canadian government for decades by saying that the Plutonium from candor reactors cannot be used for bombs, and this is an absolute downright falsehood. And a, a lot of our politicians are being misled into believing something which is simply false, and, and accepting a false sense of security. Uh, this guy's so uh, I don't have to let you read that because I already said it, right? <laughs> Uh, and now, of course, that's not how you handle plutonium. <laughs> that's not how you handle plutonium. But uh, many people are also very surprised to find out that you can handle plutonium. That it, plutonium, contrary to common uh, misconception, is not intensely radioactive. It's intensely dangerous, and it's very radiotoxic, but it is not intensely radioactive. The reason for this is it gives off very little penetrating radiation. Consequently, outside the body, it's relatively harmless, unless it's in a bomb. Uh, this woman is handling plutonium in a glove box, and it looks like Bob has crawled right into the glove box. <laughs> but actually, there's another window on the other side. Um, and, and the glove box, of course, uh, is maintained inside under negative pressure, so that if there's any leakage, the air will leak in rather than out. Because if she were to cut her finger and get some plutonium in that cut, or breathe some of the plutonium dust, it would be very, very bad news for her. Uh, because inside the body, plutonium is extremely dangerous. Outside the body, it's not. 
Uh, the, the thing is that this is another fact where people are being mystified, and it's important to demystify it, is that we use the word radiation, and it's not the right word. This is not radiation. If you talk about atomic radiation, what you're really talking about in most cases are particles. It's not radiation. Uh, alpha particles and beta particles, you will not find them anywhere on the electromagnetic spectrum. They're not waves, they're, they're particles. And they travel much slower than the speed of light, but very, very fast nevertheless. And they do a tremendous amount of damage, but they have very little penetrating power compared with gamma rays, which really do have a lot of penetrating power, like X-rays, only much more powerful. So um, the reason why plutonium is easy to transport across borders and easy to steal is because it's an alpha emitter. Yes? So Gordon, when you talk about radiotoxic and radioactive, is the gamma rays that are radioactive, is that wave? And no. the, the gamma are the particles that are toxic? No, uh, actually radioactivity, uh, I, 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 this is a, one of my pet peeves, so I better not go <laughs> off on it, but the thing is that radiation, most of our examples of radiation have an off-on switch, like light, you can turn it off, you can turn it on, that's visible radiation. If you go to an x-ray machine in a hospital, you turn the x-ray machine off, on. When you turn the x-ray machine off, it's harmless. Um, a microwave oven, you turn it on, you turn it off, no problem. But radioactivity, nobody knows how to shut off radioactivity. There's no off switch. And it's not radiation that's coming out all the time, it's particles. These are particles that are coming out. And these particles are, if you want to think of a, of a beta particle as being like a subatomic bullet, then a alpha particle would be like a subatomic cannonball because it's 8,000 times heavier than the beta particle and it's got twice the charge. So it has much less penetrating power, but it does more damage. It does about 20 times more biological damage than the beta particle. People don't understand this and, and they're mystified because nobody has ever told them. Not because they're stupid. It's not because people are stupid. It's because people are being given the wrong information or not being given the information at all. It's not difficult to understand once you get the right picture in your head as to what's going on. So and now they're, yeah? The particles are not visible to our eyes? No, no, they're totally invisible. They're subatomic particles. If you can't see an atom, these are even smaller, okay. right? Um, now, uh, the energy that is given off is, in fact, a wave, uh, but it also behaves like a particle. And one of the things that we've discovered in science is that some waves, the shorter the wavelength, the more they act like particles, because the more energy they have. And gamma rays are more particulate than most other types of waves because of the fact that they're very short wavelength, and so the bundles of energy are much more almost like particle-like, you might say. So I, I think that the proper image for radioactivity is that these atoms are disintegrating in such a way that they give off subatomic shrapnel. And it's that shrapnel that does the damage. And it's only, the, it's only at the instant that the atom disintegrates that biological harm is done. Other than that, biological harm is not done except, unless it's from the chemistry. So uh, th these are things which are important for people to know, but they usually don't. And the workers should know this, and they don't know it. They're not told this. For example, you've heard about this uranium fuel fabrication plant up at Lansdowne Avenue. How many people have heard about that? Okay, a lot. Well, um, those workers, they don't know what alpha radiation is. Nobody ever told them. And that's the principal radiation hazard they're facing. And by the way, another thing is that all of the most notoriously dangerous radioactive materials in the 20th century have been alpha emitters. Radon gas, it's an alpha emitter. Uh, radium, it's an alpha emitter. Uranium, it's an alpha emitter. Plutonium, it's an alpha emitter. And you've heard of polonium, perhaps. That was what was used to murder Alexander Litvinenko. That's an alpha emitter, too. And even the American Health Physics Society says that polonium-210, which is one of the substances that Marie Curie discovered, is responsible for about 90% of the deaths that are attributed to smoking. So the deaths that are attributed to smoking, the American Health Physics Society believes that up to 90% of those deaths, and that includes both lung cancers and heart disease, are really caused by the alpha-emitting polonium in the cigarette smoke. Anyway, here's a picture that Bob took. Again, I don't know what i do without Bob's photographs. They're just great in terms of, his whole, his whole mission is to make these things more visible, and he does a great job of it, I think. Uh, this is, a, uh, through a microscope, uh, a tissue of an ape's, an ape's lung tissue, 
This ape was an, exposed to uh, alpha emitting dust. It happened to be plutonium dust. And where you see that star, the only reason that star is there, it's an optical illusion because the camera was left open for 48 hours. And during the 48 hours, an invisibly small particle of plutonium in the lungs is giving off alpha particles. And each one of those spikes is a different event. Pshum, 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 pshum. It's giving off alpha particles, and it doesn't stop. And uh, if he left the camera o open for another 48 hours, all you'd see is a big black blob. You wouldn't see the drama of the, of, of the spikes. But that's what's going on. And of course, you can see it has very little penetrating power. It doesn't even go through a piece of paper. But it does 20 times more damage than gamma rays per unit of energy deposited. And if you compare it with a beta particle, not only is it 20 times more powerful, more biologically damaging per unit of energy deposited, but it's also about 200 times more damaging if you take into account the fact that it also packs a lot more energy too. So if you put the energy of the alpha particle together with the fact that there's a factor of 20, I figure you get close to between 100 and 200 times more biologically effective in causing cancer and genetic damage and other things of that sort. So this is a very important thing for people to know. And by the way, this is the main hazard in uranium mining, what's called the front end of the fuel cycle. This is the main hazard for uranium miners, for people living and handling uranium and so on. And it hardly even shows up on a Geiger counter because it's not penetrating. You might make the point, when, when you were on the Skype uh, at uh, the GE plant hearing, uh, I think you heard uh, over and over again that the industry uh, exploits this confusion around what's externally dangerous and what's internally dangerous. They do, really they do. And, you know, one thing you have to realize, too, it's sort of like if you've read 1984, which now seems not less futuristic than ah. it once did. <laughs> but 1984 has this wonderful idea of double think, you know, where you, you not only do you forget the truth, but you forget that you forgot it. And uh, that's double think. And uh, a lot of the people in the industry are victims of double think. And they, they really, at the moment they say what they say, they sometimes actually believe it. Because they themselves are misinformed. They themselves are not well informed. This is definitely true. Even in the environmental assessment statements, it's very shocking, but there's these huge environmental assessment statements for uranium mining operations. Not one word about alpha radiation in the whole document. Same thing about the GE Hitachi uranium fuel fabrication plant up on Lansdowne Avenue. Not one word about alpha radiation. Not one word. And yet they talk about, alpha, they talk about uh, beta and gamma, but they don't even mention alpha. And that's the main hazard. Uh, now, with regard to plutonium, I have to tell you that the way plutonium is created is inside a nuclear reactor. That's why the first reactors were built. The first reactors were built precisely to produce plutonium, not to produce electricity. And uh, in the coast, in the, uh, because when you put plutonium in, when you put uranium fuel into a nuclear reactor, what happens? The U-235 atom starts splitting and sending out a lot of neutrons. Well, those neutrons flying around, some of those neutrons hit uranium-238 atoms, which don't split, but which absorb that neutron and become heavier, and they turn into uranium-239, which rapidly changes into plutonium-239. So plutonium-239 is created inside the nuclear reactor, and every nuclear reactor produces plutonium. So uh, as Bob has pointed out to me, uh, you know, it's not really, when you look at a nuclear reactor, it's not really electricity which is its principal product. Because that's over, that's like a flash in the pan. That's over in a blip. Uh, what it's really producing is high level radioactive waste and plutonium, which lasts for thousands and thousands and hundreds of thousands and even millions of years. That's what it's really producing. And the electricity is the byproduct, rather than vice versa. Um, this plaque you will find at the visitor center at Chalk River, and uh, it, it is a testimony to the fact that the first reactor built in Canada was actually built for a military purpose, uh, and it was a military decision made in Washington, D.C. in 1944. Um, and here is the text of the plaque, uh, which says uh, that the zero energy experimental pile called ZEEP went into operation to produce plutonium for nuclear weapons. It was part, it originally conceived as a part of a program 
to produce plutonium for nuclear weapons. And for decades afterwards, Chalk River sold plutonium from Chalk River to the Americans for the weapons program as a way of financing their research because they, uh, the government of Canada said, well, why should we keep pouring money into this nuclear research? And they said, well, we can, we can generate some revenues by selling the plutonium. So they sold plutonium for decades, a lot of it. Um, and uh, by the way, the reactor that produced the plutonium is the same damn reactor that we gave to India. And then we were shocked when they used it to produce plutonium. Well, all they were doing was doing what we did except they use the plutonium themselves instead of giving it to a third party to use. So again, the hypocrisy is really deep. And at the time that that reactor was sold to the Indians, I am sure, well, I, I'm not sure, but I, I, I think that politicians are so blank on this subject. They really are. They're not scientists. And they basically say, look, you're the experts. You decide. You, you tell us what to do. Um, they really don't wrap their minds around this. And I'm sure that most politicians in Canada had no idea that, that, that this had been used by us to produce weapons-grade plutonium, and that uh, the Indians were quite capable of doing the same thing. Anyway, this is how plutonium is created. Uranium-238 is hit by a neutron, turns into plutonium-239. Those two little things that are flying off are beta particles. There are two beta particles given off. And it goes from element 92 to element 94. Uh, in between is Neptunium-239, which is element 93. Uh, of course, Neptune and Uranus uh, are the planets, and Plutonium, Pluto, you know, Ur Uranus, Pluto, Neptune, it all fits together. Uh, this is uh, the plutonium reprocessing plant in the north of England called Sellafield. Um, they are now decommissioning this, and just a week ago, uh, the verdict came down that the, the current cost estimate for decommissioning this facility is now up to $104 billion. $104 billion just to take this thing apart. Oh, I'm, I'm running out of time very rapidly, right? Yeah, but you're no. doing great. Just keep going. <laughs> keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, well, uh, by the way, this is, this is the reason, this plant is the reason why the North Sea, the Irish Sea rather, the Irish Sea is the, uh, was considered to be the most radioactive, well, was measured to be the most radioactive body of seawater in the world. Uh, they have a two mile long pipeline that goes out into the Irish Sea. And uh, that, re of course, they don't dump the high level waste out through the pipeline, but there's always plutonium in the pipeline, you know, waste, you know, it's, you can't keep it all in, can you? Um, and because plutonium is so heavy, it's even heavier than uranium, and uranium is the heaviest element in nature, they figure surely it's going to stay in the sediments and so on until a BBC crew went along and checked the vacuum bags of the cottagers and found plutonium in the vacuum bags. And obviously, the plutonium was washing up on the shore, uh, even though they had put it two miles out. Nature, you know, the thing about engineers, the engineering mentality is that, oh, with proper engineering, we can solve any problem. Well, you know, we mathematicians may be held up to scorn from time to time, but we have done a few things. And one of the things we've learned is that there are literally unsolvable problems. There are literally unsolvable problems. Problems which have been proven to be unsolvable. It has been proven that nobody will ever solve these problems. And this concept is completely absent from the engineering mentality. People have to develop a little bit of humility, particularly when it comes to the real world. Um, anyway, in order to get the plutonium out, that's the tricky part, because you've got to dissolve the highly radioactive fuel. Now, when, when, uh, I should have told you this. When the fuel comes out of the reactor, before it goes into the reactor, it's only uranium. And you can actually handle it. It's not penetrating radiation like I told you. Uh, I could have a fuel bundle and pass it around. You could look at it. And as long as you didn't uh, sort of you know, wear gloves and so on, it's not going to really give you a, a big dose of radiation. Um, but that same fuel bundle, when it comes out of the reactor, will kill you in 20 seconds, under 20 seconds. And the reason why is because those broken little fragments of uranium are millions of times more radioactive than the uranium, and they give off a blast of penetrating radiation. They'll kill you at a distance of one meter in 20 seconds. 
Uh, so that's why these things will never be handled by human hands again. They'll only be handled robotically. Well, in order to get the plutonium out of the fuel, they have to chop up the fuel. And of course, they don't hire people to do this. They have robots. They have robotic choppers. And they dump it into baskets in boiling nitric acid. And they dissolve as much of it as they can. And lots of radioactive gases come off because 20% of the fission products are gases. And they're very radioactive gases. And, uh, and there's vapors as well. Vapors are things which are not really gases, but which easily turn into gaseous form and then condense again, like cesium-137, iodine-131, and so on. Uh, iodine-129, rather, because that's the longer-lived one. Um, but so you get millions of gallons of liquid radioactive waste. And that's what they want to truck down the Canada Highway from Chalk River. The liquid leftovers from dissolving this stuff and, and dissolving it in nitric acid, now they want to ship it across the Trans-Canada Highway? Come on. This has never been done in North America up until the present time, as far as I know. Uh, I've been trying to find out, but I talked to Bob Alvarez and I talked to a bunch of other people and they say that there has been no shipments to their knowledge ever of high-level liquid radioactive waste, which is what our government wants to send down to Savannah River starting in August of this year. So uh, please, if you haven't taken action before now, please write to the responsible, the irresponsible authorities <laughs> <laughs> and express yourself on this subject. Because if there's enough public attention, I think it can be halted, just like we halted the shipment of the steam generators through the Great Lakes. It never took place, even though they got a license and everything. It was all legal, but they never did it because there was such an uproar about it. So I, I do think that public pressure does work. And it's time that we really get ourselves mobilized on these things. Anyway, uh, just last week or two weeks ago, they discovered that six of these tanks are leaking. Uh, they've leaked millions of gallons into the soil. One gallon is enough to ruin an entire city's water supply. And it's so radioactive, they can't dig it up. It's more dangerous to dig it up than to leave it where it is. So uh, <clears throat> talk about craziness, eh? This is a man whom I came to have a great affection for, Ted Taylor, he's passed on. He was a bomb designer, and if you ever want to read a book that'll just really blow your mind, it's called The Curve of Binding Energy. It's by John McPhee, and I read it years and years and years ago. And John McPhee and Ted Taylor did a trip across the United States visiting all the different places where plutonium is stored. And the book intermingles that story of this uh, trip around the United States with the story of Ted Taylor's life. And it's a wonderful book. It's very, very interesting. The Curve of Binding Energy by McPhee. Anyway, Ted Taylor uh, designed both the largest and the smallest bombs in the nuclear arsenal of the United States. He was a bomb designer. And for years and years and years, he just thought of it as being sweet physics. He described it that way himself. It was just a sweet physics problem. And then, at a certain point in time, he had a crise de conscience, and he just sort of realized what he was doing. And there's a very moving part in this Suzuki show that I was in, where it starts off with him talking about being in Moscow. And, uh, and he had this flashback. He was in Moscow with all these wonderful people around him, and all these married couples and tourists, and just so joyful. And he remembered, he had a flashback to when he was designing a bomb and he was disappointed that his bomb wouldn't power, be powerful enough to kill absolutely everybody in Moscow. And, uh, and he said, and now, today, I have flashbacks about that event, just being in Moscow and remembering that. But here's a man who really saw the implications of what he was doing. And my first contact with him was through the newspaper when I first got involved in this. I read his comment, he said, and almost a direct quote, it is all too easy for a madman or a terrorist to uh, build an atomic bomb. I've been worried ever since I made my first one. <laughs> now, uh, this part, I don't even understand this title, Uranium and Nuclear Reactors. Uh, oh, oh, I guess I'm, my point is that up until now, I've been dwelling on the military. But in fact, you know, people think, would like to think, that uranium is really used for peaceful purposes to supply energy. This is the good side, you know, the yin-yang sort of thing. Um, uh, I think it's self-deception, but, uh, but uh, a lot of people believe this, and certainly people want to believe this. 
I, I, be, I certainly believed it when I was in high school. I mean, I wanted to be a nuclear physicist because I thought it was wonderful. I mean, it just sounds, it sounded like a problem-free technology. Who can be against it? If it's clean, safe, cheap, and abundant, hey. <laughs> um, now, uh, as I told you before, the Cirrus reactor, that's the one on the right there, that's another reactor there. The Americans are now forcing, as part of their agreement with India, to shut that reactor down. But they're not forcing them to get rid of their nuclear weapons, of course, they don't have the power to do that. Nor are they even forcing them to stop building them, actually. So, you know, again, the double standard, you know? Like, we, we talk about North Korea and Iran as being pariahs because they're trying to build nuclear weapons. Well, we're good friends with Israel, with India, with Pakistan, uh, and with the United States, and with the UK, and with France, who all of whom have nuclear weapons. So I mean, the hypocrisy, again, is just so blatant. It, it's really something that uh, has got to be addressed. People have got to wake up out of their, their, their sleepwalking and uh, start only, acting on this. Science for Peace. There's only one nation next to us that has got the criminal record of nuclear age. Right. <laughs> anyway, uh, the, uh, you know, if they say the eagle has landed, I guess they would have said the, the Buddha has blasted. <laughs> because they called the explosion Smiling Buddha, uh, the nuclear explosion in 1974. Now, when this happened, of course, Trudeau, uh, among other people all around the world, were very shocked and very angry. And we cut off all, supposedly, we cut off all assistance and all cooperation with India. No more nuclear cooperation with India. They are pariahs. They're outsiders, right? Outcasts. But um, India said, hey, what are you getting excited about? This is a peaceful nuclear explosion. Um, this is not a bomb. This is not no part of a military program. You yourself have been using nuclear explosives for peaceful purposes. You have an operation called Operation Gas Buggy, where you explode nuclear bombs and try to get gas. Now, they didn't actually explode the nuclear bombs, but it was, it was a, a serious proposal. They were even talking about using a string of nuclear bombs to build a new Panama Canal. And Russia was using peaceful nuclear explosives. India said, look, uh, you use dynamite to blow up a tree stump. Uh, we might want to use nuclear explosives to create a harbor. Why are you pointing the finger at us? And strangely enough, there it is, even to this day, in Article 5 of the Non-Proliferation Treaty, there are none so blind as those who will not read. Article 5 says, each party to the treaty undertakes to ensure that in accordance with this treaty, potential benefits from any peaceful applications of nuclear explosions will be made available to non-nuclear weapon states, party to the treaty, on a non-discriminatory basis. Read that clause, it's still there. Now, I think this is a very important thing for everybody to pay attention to this, because when people talk about the Non-Proliferation Treaty, they use it, like the Bible, to their advantage. They quote those parts that they like. Uh, and they don't look at the parts they don't like. This is a part that nobody likes. Now, the thing is that even though that language is still in the treaty, nobody takes it seriously. Nobody believes that anybody's going to get any peaceful nuclear explosives anytime soon. But they're afraid to rewrite the language because if they open up that treaty, it could, the whole thing could just fall apart. Uh, trying to put it back together again, trying to make another treaty would be virtually impossible. So what they've done is they've simply chosen to ignore that clause. Everybody has just agreed we, we don't see that clause anymore. Article 5, it goes from <coughs> Article 4 to Article 6. <laughs> and, or actually, in the case of the nuclear weapon states, it goes to Article 7 because they don't, want, they don't like Article 6 either. Article 6 is the one where they have to get rid of their nuclear weapons. <laughs> so, uh, but, but this is very important for you to realize because uh, when people tell you that certain things are impossible because of the Non-Proliferation Treaty, not true. Nothing is impossible. If the political will is there, things are possible. And the political will is there to, to ignore this part of the treaty. And the political will could be there and should be there and must be there to ignore certain other parts of the treaty as well. Not the good parts. I think Article 6 is a good part. They should get rid of their weapons for sure. But there's other parts which promise access to things like plutonium, which also have to be said, no, we're not going to take that seriously. Nobody is going to have access to plutonium if you want a nuclear weapons free world. Because the point is that if you could imagine a world truly free of nuclear weapons, how can you have such a world and believe in it if plutonium is flying around? 
If plutonium is in circulation and people have ready access to plutonium, how can you possibly trust that any ban on nuclear weapons would ever last? So that's why I believe that access to those strategic nuclear materials. Now, we've already taken the first step. In fact, we've already taken two steps. All we need to do is take the third step. The first step is we have agreed that peaceful nuclear explosions are insane. We have agreed to that. And we're now agreeing that highly enriched uranium is insane. That the Obama summit of April 2010, when Obama called all the world leaders down to Washington, the focus of that summit was to call back all of the highly enriched uranium in the world. Oh, well, in the, in the world that's accessible. <laughs> Um, and, and to try and really nail down this stuff because it's so proliferation prone. And not just proliferation prone to countries, but proliferation prone to anybody. I mean, you know, really almost anybody could make a bomb out of this stuff. So, um, so I think we're, you know, those steps are, should be applauded, but you can't sort of then drop the ball and sort of say, well, plutonium is a different matter. Everybody can have access to plutonium. That's just opening the door to another nightmare. We sort of realized in time, perhaps in time, maybe not in time, that the highly enriched uranium was a bad idea because at one time it was freely available and now it's not. Uh, so, but Science for Peace and other organizations like you and Pugwash and so on, I think we really have to get on this and really push it hard in an educational way, not just in terms of influencing leadership, but influencing the public as well, to understand the stakes, the enormous stakes that are uh, here. India, of course, went on to build lots of nuclear reactors, even though Canada failed to cooperate. They built over 30 can-do clones. We sold them a couple of can-do reactors, and they just built a whole bunch more of them. Uh, you know, monkey see, monkey do. Or uh, study the plan. Uh, that's a very derogatory thing. I apologize. I immediately apologize. But what I mean is it's not that difficult once you've got one of these things operating to copy the design. Now, it wasn't the latest version of a CANDU reactor. It's not a CANDU 6. But, and they do have a lot of problems. But they've got them running, lots of them. Now, here's where I, I, I thought I would just show you this. I, I hope I'm. Am I okay? Well, you, yeah. Why don't you take another five minutes, at, or at least okay. ten, ten minutes? Of yeah. Okay. Three questions. I, I'm, I'm getting close to okay. the end. I think. I just want to show you something I think is quite remarkable, and that is, we think of Canada as a peaceful country, and it is. It's a great country, and Canada was the only country that had the ability fully to develop nuclear weapons, and nobody would have gainsaid that. Nobody would have said boo had Canada developed nuclear weapons right after World War II, because we were right in the thick of it. But we chose not to. We chose not to. Now, Britain decided to build nuclear weapons, and they used Canada to do the work for them uh, initially, because they didn't have any reactors. Whereas the British were in Shock River, and they had helped to design the NRX reactor. And so they said, well, hey, uh, let's get some plutonium from Canada. And so they got their first plutonium from Canada. They got them. They got a sphere of plutonium metal from Canada in the same year that they exploded their first atomic bomb in the, in the Montebello Islands off Australia. Uh, so we, in fact, contributed to, uh, of course, we were partners with the United States and England. We sold lots of uranium and lots of plutonium to the United States. We sold uh, just a bit of plutonium, but we gave them the reprocessing technology. Really, uh, Britain and France, too, Develop, you know, after the war, Britain and France had superior reprocessing technology to the United States. Reprocessing, for those of you who don't know, is the technology for extracting plutonium in the liquid form. And because the Americans were trying to do everything at once, they were trying to build the uranium bomb, they were trying to produce the plutonium, they were trying to do the assembly thing with the implosion device, they were doing so many things that they kind of didn't do the best job on the reprocessing part of it. And the British and the Canadians, and the, the Europeans, rather, did really a much better job. And this is why uh, uh, both Britain and, it was because of their experience at uh, Montreal, the secret Montreal laboratory, and then later at Chalk River, that they got such a head start on reprocessing technology. But there's more direct connections. Uh, Russia was actually sent its first sample of plutonium from Chalk River because there were a couple of spies in the team there. And uh, 
there was a little speck of plutonium that was sold, that was uh, sent to Russia, and tiny, tiny little speck. But that was all they needed to sort of determine certain basic properties of plutonium. So that came from Chalk River, and then it turns out that later on, of course, we sold reactors uh, and gave reactors to India and Pakistan and Taiwan. And the reactors we gave them are the NRX copies, uh, in the, or can do's. Um, and of course, the NRX is very, very good at producing weapons grade plutonium. It's ideal. And, uh, and that's exactly what they used it for. And even now, I just read some articles today on the way down here on the internet uh, where uh, some Indian commentators are complaining b bitterly about shutting down the Cirrus reactor because it's the best military plutonium producing machine they have. Um, and Taiwan, actually, after the Indian explosion in 1974, the CIA went into Taiwan, which also had a Canadian reactor, and they discovered that they had already built a secret reprocessing plant. And they took that all apart, and uh, the, the Americans insisted that all the spent fuel be repatriated to the United States. They're the ones who supplied the fuel, because we don't have any enrichment. So the fuel for both the Cirrus and the, and the Taiwan reactors came from uh, the United States. But we built the reactors. Now, France, of course, helped Israel to build the Demona reactors, which gave them their nuclear weapons. And I was tipped off by Paul McKay, a very good uh, journalist and uh, investigative reporter, award-winning guy, great guy. Um, and he told me that he had heard authoritatively from people that the uh, Demona reactor is basically an NRX reactor, too. You see, the French people who were in the French people were part of the team in the Montreal laboratory who designed the NRX reactor. And it wasn't until the war was over that the Americans forced the French to get the hell out of there. The, the, French, the, the Americans didn't trust them because they were, well, communists. And, uh, well, one of them was. And uh, not, not the one who was there, but one of the guys back home was. Um, and so uh, uh, they, the Americans didn't like these Europeans at all. You know, they still don't. And uh, they wanted them to get out. But the British state and, uh, and um, but the actual knowledge of how to build the NRX reactor was well known to the French as well as to the British because they designed it in uh, Montreal. And uh, they helped Israel. By the way, I have a, a video uh, that was sent around, not mine, of the whole Israeli complex, uh, the military complex. If you want to take a look at it, I'll send you a link again and you can check it out. It's pretty amazing. Anybody look at that? I sent it out in October of last year, but it's, it's an amazing video. It's, it's the work of Vanunu that, uh, that uh, really made this stuff all, of, all available to the world's knowledge, and he's suffering very heavily for it, as you know, in prison still. Eh? Well, is he in prison still? No, he's, he's not arrest. in prison now. Something okay. like house arrest. Okay, good. It's restricted. Yeah. Um, and then there's Argentina and South Korea. Now, Argentina and South Korea, the Argentina under the generals, I don't know if you remember. <laughs> But when the generals were murdering people in the tens of thousands, disappeared people and so on, the longshoremen, the St. John longshoremen refused, they refused, they went on strike to refuse to load a, a shipload of uranium to send to, to Argentina. Huh? Heavy water. Heavy water. Wasn't uh, heavy water? It's heavy water, that's what it was. How long did they have heavy water in, uh, in New Brunswick? It was trucked there for a shipment to Argentina. From Glace Bay or something? Uh, no, uh, Bruce? Because they did have a fuel fabrication plant. I'm not anyway, sure Bruce or Chalk River. anyway, so St. John and Longshoreman, they said they'd rather go to jail because they were murdering unionists down there too, uh, you know, all the time, and as well as helpless people of all sorts. Well, uh, they had a cabinet meeting, and we had access to the cabinet notes later on, illegally, of course. You can't publish them or anything. But, uh, but they decided that it would, be, it would irreparably harm Canada's reputation as a nuclear supplier not to meet their obligations. So they had that stuff trucked to the Mirabel Airport and secretly flown down to Argentina in the middle of that whole mess. Uh, it just shows you the lengths to which some you know, people will go thinking that they have to keep up their commercial uh, conventions. Yeah. Anyway, um, so... The amazing thing is that Canada, be, while being very pristine and pure, uh, has had a kind of a, a little hand in all these nuclear weapons programs. The American, the British, the Israeli, the South, <laughs> indirectly. Now, uh, Argentina and South Korea, neither one of them did develop nuclear weapons, nor did Taiwan, 
But all three of them made efforts in that direction. And in fact, uh, Argentina had a reprocessing plant, and they even had purchased rockets, and so on and so on. Uh, South Korea also had, uh, was even in Time magazine that South Korea said that they were, they were definitely going to build their own nuclear arsenal. They couldn't rely upon the United States. The way you show it, it appears like Canada is the kingpin of the nuclear market. Well, that's, that's of course a great exaggeration. It's certainly not true, uh, but, I think kingpin, uh, but I think Canada has been, it's left its ethics at the door for sure. You know, they've hung it up on the door and not, never looked at it again. Uh, they've never really taken an ethical stance on this, as far as I know. Uh, I, I'd, be, I'd be happy to be corrected on that. If anybody knows some examples where Canada really did stood up proudly, I'd be happy to know about it. But I don't know of any kind. Of yeah, right, right. Good. Anyway, now uh, here's the nuclear fuel cycle um, that comes off the map, the, uh, the map, nuclear map of Canada that Bob and I made. Um, from the mine on the left-hand side, through the mill, to the refinery, uh, to the uh, fuel fabrication plant, which is up in Lansdowne Avenue, to the nuclear reactor, which is just east of Toronto, to the storage pool, where they store it for, they have to store it in the storage pool for seven years, so it doesn't overheat, and then a dry storage after that, and then we don't know where the destination finally is. So that's the question mark there. That's what they call the nuclear fuel cycle, and the most amazing thing about it, of course, is there's nothing cyclic about it. It's totally a chain. So we have taken, we've taken to calling it the nuclear fuel chain. But when they talk about the nuclear fuel cycle, this is what they're talking about. They're talking about that middle portion. That's the cycling part. It's when you go from the refinery to the enrichment plant, and then back to fuel fabrication, then, in that case, you can use the enrichment plant to produce weapons-grade uranium and, and make bombs. So there's a bomb connection there. As long as you stay away from the enrichment and the reprocessing, there's no way you can make a bomb. If you don't have enrichment and you don't have reprocessing, then you don't have highly enriched uranium, you don't have plutonium, you don't have a bomb. Now, Trudeau, when he addressed the uh, general session on disarmament in the United Nations in 1978, he made that exact point in his speech on the strategy of suffocation. He said that if we're serious about getting rid of nuclear weapons, we have to adopt a strategy of suffocation. We have to suffocate the arms race by choking off the supply, the raw, the supply of raw materials on which it feeds, and by which he meant highly enriched uranium and plutonium. So in other words, the way to begin to uh, choke off the arms race is to stop making these things available and stop and outlaw the production of them. So, and of course, that's bad news for the nuclear industry, but the question is, which was more important? Uh, so you have to sign and make a choice there. The trouble is, if you want to say, well, we need to keep our nuclear industry going, so we have to allow reprocessing, like they want to do in Japan, like they're doing in lot. Every country that's made a major commitment to nuclear power has invested in reprocessing. Um, because they see that as the wave of the future. You know why? Because they know they're going to run out of uranium. And therefore, they know they're going to have to start using plutonium as a fuel. That's, they've always known that. And they've always thought that. So that's why they don't want to shut the door to reprocessing. But if they don't shut the door to reprocessing, I think the chance of a nuclear weapons-free world is a dead dodo. And here is, of course, the, the key points right here at the bottom. That's really. Those are the key technologies. And Trudeau fingered them back in 1978, and I think he was a pretty smart cookie when he did that. Wasn't always such a smart cookie, but he was smart then. Um, and here's another way of looking at it. I, this is my own uh, uh, kind of a cyclical thing. If you walk, the funny thing is the can-do reactor, as originally designed to run on natural uranium, is relatively free of proliferation risks because even though we mine the uranium, we mill it, we refine it, we fabricate it, we put it in the reactor, we have a spent fuel, but we don't enrich it and we don't reprocess it. Well, you know, in that case, uh, that's conceivable. But they're getting away from that now. Now they say all future can-do reactors are going to use enriched uranium. So uh, that's where you get into this mess. That's where you get into the proliferation mess. So look, I think uh, I've said enough, uh, I've kept you long enough, and I'm just going to quickly go through this. Um, 
Uh, as I said, uh, what happens in a nuclear reactor is the fuel becomes so radioactive that it continues to generate heat, and this explains another thing that since we're almost at the anniversary of Fukushima, I must say something about Fukushima, and it's very brief. But that is simply this fundamental fact that mo almost nobody has been ex had it explained to them. Why do they have to keep cooling this thing years after it's shut down? I mean, it shut down seconds after the earthquake. Why are they still cooling it? The reason is that they can't shut off the radioactivity. That's the reason. So when they shut it down, here's the Fukushima, the four of the Fukushima reactors, units one to four, before the earthquake, and they looked exactly the same after the earthquake because there was no visible damage to the plants caused by the earthquake, or even very much by the tsunami either. Um, but, uh, uh, sorry, <laughs> a couple of days later, sorry, a couple of days later, these things started uh, exploding. I, I don't know what happened there. Here we are. So a couple of days later, after the tsunami, they started exploding, bam, 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 and then they started, and, and they were melting down inside, and they've been cooling them ever since. And the point is that this is all self-inflicted damage. This damage is not damage from the, from the earthquake. It's not damage from the tsunami. It's damage from the nuclear waste inside the reactor. The heat and the, and the chemical reactions from the, the hot fuel is what generates the hydrogen gas that exploded, which causes the meltdown. And you have to understand this thing, and that is that heat is not the same thing as temperature. It doesn't mean that it's hot. It means that it's getting hotter and hotter and hotter. That's what it means. Because it is adding heat perpetually. Why? Because the radioactivity is unstoppable. And so if you leave it alone and you don't cool it, the, the temperature is going to go up and up and up. And that's why they have been trying to cool it for years to try and keep it from melting down. When they take the fuel out of the reactor, they have to put it in a pool for seven to 10 years. They have to cool it for seven to 10 years with circulating water to prevent it from melt, for, to, to prevent it from damaging itself and releasing radioactive uh, gases into the atmosphere. So anyway, I just wanted to say that because we're at the anniversary of Fukushima and I think it's something. We are, I think, going to be regretting it if we allow new reactors to continue to be built on the shores of the Great Lakes, which provide drinking water for 40 million people. And I think the idea of continuing to build nuclear reactors on the Great Lakes and refurbish the old reactors is crazy. And if they are going to insist upon building more reactors, they should not be building them there. Because just as Japan, you know, people say, why did they build it there? Well, hindsight, you know, is one thing, and foresight is another. But we have the advantage of seeing the Fukushima example, and one of the biggest problems they're having at Fukushima is containing huge volumes of radioactive water. Even now, they, they're having trouble containing it. It's just enormous quantities. Uh, so look, that's it, I think. Um, the heat continued. By the way, the heat can, this is an AECO document. The, this is the, uh, the, these horizontal lines are supposed to represent geographical strata under the ground, rock strata. And the red indicates the heat of the buried radioactive waste, which has come out of the reactor 70 years ago. And that 70 year old fuel, and if they leave it there, because the heat has nowhere to go, it heats up the rocks, and that's what it looks like in 4,000 years. And this is what it looks like in 8,000 years. And this is part of a series of graphics put together by Atomic Energy of Canada Limited, which lasts for roughly 50,000 years. After 50,000 years, the, the temperature of the rocks returns to just about double what it was originally. And they call this whole 50-year period the thermal pulse, because it's like a little blip on the screen of history. Um, anyway, um, thank you very much for your patience. And I, I just want to conclude by showing you, this is one of Bob's favorite pictures. He calls it the Maids of Muslimovo. These are the people who live right near the Mayak uh, reprocessing plant in northern Russia, right near where that uh, meteorite just came down and exploded over Russia recently. And these women are finding out for the first time that the sickness that has been afflicting the people of this uh, is due to the fact that Joe Stalin wanted a nuclear bomb for his birthday. And so they were dumping high-level radioactive waste into the Techa River. 
And the doctors were forbidden to use the word radioactivity. They had to use the word vegetative syndrome. Thank you. Oh my God.